good morning, church. Come on, it's a great day to be in the house. Come on, let's stand up. Let's get ready to enter in the presence of Jesus today. We're going to sing about his faithfulness. Yes. 
this morning. Yes, we are. Well, you've joined us on our favorite Sunday of the month. It is Baptism Sunday. Baptism is simply an outward expression of an inward change. Baptism is a moment where people that have already decided that Jesus is their Lord and Savior to make their PSA public service announcement that their life is no longer their own, they're living for something much greater. So what's gonna happen in a moment for the first timers here is you're gonna see people come down into this pool and they're gonna go under the water and when they come up, what are we gonna do? That was weak. What are we going to do? Let's continue with worship.
thank him this morning if he saved you from yourself if he brought you from somewhere we thank you Jesus oh we thank you yes for all you've done I want to say thank you thank you I have to say thank you thank you I have to say
sing it out. Oh my. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. Oh, on your faithfulness.
something this morning, if you need healing, if you need God to show up, would you just sing this out? Can we make this our declaration this morning? All throughout the Bible you see in times much like where we're at now, where culture is dark we live in a broken lost hurting world it's when believers came together and made a declaration similar to this God I need you God we desperately need you we're seeking your face God always shows up and does something amazing it's when there's expectation it's when people come together declaring this and this morning I just want to pause for a moment before we continue with the rest of the service and I want to sing this again just God I need you I don't know what you need in your family. I don't know what the need is in your marriage, but I know what the need is in our country, in our culture, and it is a significant move of God. And I believe when the church comes together and begins to prophetically declare statements like this, God, we need you. We need you in our schools. We need you in our families. We need you in our community. Something begins to shift. So can we sing that again? Can we sing that again, please? Come on, sing this. Oh, God, my God, I need you. Come on, lift your hands oh, and begin God, to declare this. Yeah, we need you, we need you, we need you in our family. We need you in our school, we need you in our community. Oh, rock, rock, rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. Oh, on your faithfulness. Oh, God, my God, I need you. Oh, God, my God. that you are faithful. The song is all about your faithfulness, Father. 
We thank you for Hebrews 13, 8 that says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if you are faithful then, we know that you will continue to be faithful again, Father. Father, we pray that this morning you come and do something different. You come and show up in a mighty way. We know that it's not just when a message happens or when worship happens, but it's when your presence shows up in the building is when things begin to change, Father. So right now, we declare that we need you. We need the physical presence of God in this place. Come and have your way. Come and do what only you can do this morning. Father, we pray for you to do something significant, not just here, but across all of our campuses at Broussard, Opelousas, Midtown, New Iberia. We are coming together corporately to declare, we need you. So Father, we thank you for what you've already done. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do. And it is in the mighty, powerful, and precious name of Jesus that we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Well, welcome to Our Savior's Church. My name is Pastor Joseph Aranza. And alongside with my beautiful wife, Rochelle, we serve as the youth and young adult pastors here at OSC. Hey, why don't you do me a favor? We're going to take about 10 to 15 seconds, turn around, give someone a fist bump, a high five, and tell them I'm glad you're in church this morning. Hey, we want to welcome all of those watching online. We're so grateful that you decided to tune in with us this morning. And we want to give a special shout out to those of you watching from the Lafayette Correctional Facility. Can we welcome those watching? You guys are a part of this church family. If this is your first time joining us here in person, let me be the first to say welcome. We know that there are so many great churches in the area that you could have attended, and we do not take it lightly that you decided to worship with us. So if you do me a favor and reach into the pew pocket in front of you, you'll find one of these blue Get Connected cards. If you'll just simply take a moment and fill some information out, we just want to connect with you. When you're done doing that, you can do one of three things. You can either leave it on the pew, you can place it in the containers as they pass by, or you can bring this to the next steps area in the back. Well, as always, we want to continue our worship with our giving. Uh, this last week for our serve day, we were able to go to Youngsville Middle and go redo their bathrooms, redo classrooms, paint the school. Come on, that's awesome. There's nothing greater than being able to be the hands and feet of Jesus to our community, being able to be the church outside of these four walls. It's our greatest privilege as our Savior's church to be able to do things like this for our community. Isn't that amazing to go to our schools and love on our schools? I don't know the last time you've been to a middle school lately, but when you show up and redo the bathrooms, that's significant. <laughs> Let me remind you that none of this is possible without your generosity. Thank you for continuing to be a generous church. As always, I remind you there are three ways that you can give here. The first is in person as the ushers begin to pass out the containers. The second is by going online at OurSaviorsChurch.com forward slash give. Or lastly, you can text OSC family to 833-271-8565. Well, hey, we have so many amazing things happening here at OSC. One of the things we're so fired up about is our next steps. Now, I feel like so often, come on, that's our next steps pastor, just cheering them on. One conversation I have frequently with people is they always ask me, pastor, how do I get involved? I want to serve on the production team. I want to get on the worship team. I, I want to be a greeter. What's my next step? Your next step is next steps. We have a next steps class happening at 1 p.m. after service. Child care and lunch is provided. Do not miss an opportunity to take your next steps. Hey, how many of you have been enjoying our Wednesday encounter nights? Those have been great. Every Wednesday night here, 6.30 p.m. at our Lafayette campus, if you've not been able to come, it's simply that, it's an encounter night. It's an opportunity to, presence the encounter, wow, to encounter the presence of God. Sometimes we pray, sometimes there's teaching, sometimes there's worship. It's been my favorite part of the week. If you've not been able to come out this Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. Hey ladies, have y'all wanna join the women's study that there's been going on, the women's study? I have some bittersweet news for you this morning. Our very last one is this Thursday. Oh, come on, everybody say, oh. 
But the good news is you have one more opportunity to show up if you've not been able to come. We have child care for all the mamas that would love to make it but can't because your babies. Child care is provided. We always want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to remove the obstacles between you and getting everything God has for you. This Thursday, 6.30 p.m., our very last women's study. Hey, last but certainly not least, we have our Harvest Fest coming up this Saturday. Let me tell you why I love Harvest Fest. Okay, it's amazing. We have free food. We, we have rides. So many great things are going to happen. Last year, we had thousands of people show up. I love it because it's an opportunity for people to come to church that would usually never come to church. You know, social really leads to spiritual oftentimes. It's oftentimes meeting someone and having a conversation that leads to an invite to come and sit in these pews. This is a phenomenal outreach opportunity. But let me tell you something. These outreaches, it's a big event to put on, meaning volunteers are needed. So if you're interested in volunteering, you can text FALL to 337-806-8895. Well, hey, Pastor Chris Reese has an amazing message prepared just for you. But first, turn your attention to the screens. Winston? I thought it would be a great day to plant a tree. I suppose so. Well, what kind of tree is it, Papa Winston? Lauren, it's an apple tree. Do you like apples? Oh, I love apples. Those are my favorite. I thought so. How much longer will it be until we can eat these apples, Papa Winston? Well, Lauren, it could be about 20 years. Oh, 20 years? Papa Winston, I was thinking, and I don't think you'll be able to have one of these apples. It's okay, Lauren. I didn't plant this tree for me. Church, put your hands together. Come on. 
I want to welcome you to our Legacy Series. And if you've been here long enough over the years, you know that each and every single year we talk about legacy. Because it's an opportunity for us to make an eternal impact, to be like Papa Winston, where we get to plant something that many of us may never eat the fruit of, but future generations will. It's to make an internal impact. But I don't want to just talk about leaving a legacy. I want to talk about what it means to live a legacy life. Now, I want you to think about this question. Don't answer it. Just think about it. Does your life matter? Have you made a difference? These aren't questions to poke at you. These are questions that oftentimes we don't ask until the very end. Until it's on your deathbed or something tragic happens to a loved one, we begin thinking about our mortality. We begin thinking about it in a way that we've never thought about before. And I can tell you how I would answer that question if you want to know how your pastor would answer that. If you're going, how would you answer? Have you made a difference or... All the, here's what I would answer. I hope so. How many hope they would, they've made a difference? They will make a difference. I think everybody in here would hopefully. But none of us really know that. Because many times, we don't usually hear the nice things people say about us until our funeral. And we, and we don't hear it, right? Why do people reserve all the good things for when you're already gone and you don't care anymore, right? Like, we we need to answer these questions. We need to ask these questions. We need to say these things. We need to live a legacy life way before we ever get to the funeral, way before we ever try to attend our own funeral. And you're going to attend your own funeral. I've always been interested to see what would happen or who would show up or what they would say about me. I hope they would say good things, right? Well, it happened. Not to me, but to, in 2007, A man in Bosnia, it only happens in Bosnia, right, faked his own death to see what would happen at his funeral. Now, I want you to imagine for a second you attending your own funeral and you're laughing because you're like, man, what would people say about me? Would they cry for me? Would they laugh at me? Who would show up? Because some of y'all would go like, oh, no, she didn't just show up with him, right? And some of you, you, you just, you, you would, you're thinking about all of these things. Well, this man in Bosnia faked his death to see who would show up. Poor guy, the only person that showed up was his mother. That's literally it. And how many would say, that's not the legacy that I want to live or to leave right now. I don't want just my mom showing up. Hopefully she doesn't show up. Hopefully she's long gone. But we all have to think about what that looks like and the legacy that we want to live and to leave. What is a legacy though? Legacy is simply this, is a future without you, yet still influenced by you. It's your mark. Or to say it this way, inheritance is what you leave when you're gone, but legacy is who you leave when you're gone. It's something greater. And I want you to look at yourself this morning. I want to look at your family. I want you to think about your family line, because all of us are a product of someone's legacy. Amen? We're all a product of someone's legacy. Because when we say legacy, most of us think of great things. But how many know legacy can be good and legacy can be dysfunctional? Come on. I don't know the background that you came from. I don't know how your family was or is, but some of us have come from a legacy of bad choices. Where your, your mom, time and time, and her grandma, and your grandma, and your grandma, all of a sudden kept marrying these men that just were never good to them. And bad choice after bad choice has been the legacy in your family. Maybe you come from a legacy like me of addictions. Well, your father or your mother or your grandma or your uncle, or your auntie or them, whoever, you came from a legacy of addicts. Some of you come from a legacy of divorce where you can't even think of a family member back then that has stayed married. You come from a legacy divorce. Some more simple, maybe it's a legacy of anger or financial struggle constantly in a poverty mindset. Some of you just come from a a legacy of a fatherless home where your father was never there. I know that's my story. I come from a legacy of abandonment. At two years old, my father walked out on me, my brother, and my mom. He, He was an alcoholic. And I later came to find out that my dad's dad, my grandfather, did the same thing. He was an alcoholic who left his family. And his 
grandfather did the same thing. And this legacy of abandonment plagued my family until it got to me. Now, Pastor Chris, why, uh, why didn't you fall in line with that legacy? Can I tell you this morning, one reason and one reason only is the life-changing power of Jesus in my life. It's the only answer. And now I get to choose my legacy. My legacy doesn't choose me. I get to choose my legacy, the legacy that I want to live, the legacy that I want to leave behind. And so do you. Well, how do I do that? How do I not just leave a legacy, but how do I live a legacy? I want to give you two words this morning to kick us off and to get you start to think right now. Because these words are huge and you may not understand them, but we're going to talk about them. But the big way that you live a legacy life is by these two words, future faithfulness. I want you to say that with me, future faithfulness. Say future faithfulness. It's future faithfulness. What is future faithfulness? Well, you just saw what future faithfulness was. You saw in the video, and we've had that video for the past 20 years. I mean, it's been a long time coming. We just remade that video, the apple tree video. And what an emotional scene when young Lauren realizes that Papa Winston will never be able to eat from the tree that he just planted. You see, what he was doing was faithfully digging a hole, faithfully putting down a tree, faithfully watering it, caring for it, because in the future, his faithfulness now was going to do something later. Amen? It was going to bear fruit later. So it's a future faithfulness. It's faithfulness today that is doing something tomorrow. Listen to me. Listen to this. Your legacy is dependent upon your future faithfulness today. Your legacy is dependent upon your future faithfulness today. And Psalm 112 is a beautiful, listen to me, it is a psalm of encouraging future faithfulness. And I'm gonna encourage you to go back and read the whole thing. We're only gonna read a couple verses this morning. But Psalm 112, it's not a teaching psalm where you're gonna learn something. It is a psalm of future faithfulness. It is a psalm of God's promises. It is a psalm of cause and effect where when you begin to have future faithfulness, things begin to change. You live and leave a legacy. And we're just gonna read two verses this morning in Psalm 112 because I wanna help you learn what it means to have future faithfulness. Here's what it means in Psalm 112, verse five and six. It says this, good will come to those who are what? Generous and lend freely. Notice, he doesn't say good comes to those who keep everything and stock up and store up and have a nice 401k plan and those are all great things. It says good comes to those who are generous, who lend freely, but it's not just about giving, it's also about living. Come on. Because he says, also who conduct their affairs with justice. So it can't just be about what you're giving. It also has to be about how you're living. How many of you know, you can give all you want, but if you live, whew, if you live a certain way, all that giving just meant nothing without the example of what it means to live of that. And then here comes verse six. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. What a great promise. Notice how it didn't say that there won't be shaking. It just said future faithfulness, you'll never be shaken in here. Shaking might be going on around here in your family, in your finances, in your job, with your boss, but the shaking in here, it won't stop me because I believe in future faithfulness. And then here's our legacy verse. It ends like this. Those people, they will be remembered forever. Forever. The psalmist mentions two things that I want to go over this morning. The first thing he says is this, that a living a life of legacy is number one, we have to, we have to be giving to something that will outlive me. The, the, the term he uses is generous and lend freely. I mean, we have to give, find a place, find a church, find a cause that you want to give freely to, that you want to give. And many, many of you, when I say give, you think money. I'm not, that's not, the Bible didn't just talk about giving money. We all have something to give. 
whether it's time, talent, energy, resources. Some of you, you have joy. Joy is your strength. You, you come, you're the 5 a.m. person going, hi, good morning. And everybody's like, oh, you're up, you know. I have a child like that. I love him. But he gets up in the morning, he's dressed, socks on, everything else, hair combed, eats his breakfast. He's like, dad, what are we doing today? I'm like, dude, it is 5.15 in the morning. I am like, get my cup of coffee. I'm about to go pray. Like, you need to find something to do. I'll, but what are we doing? Like, what's the plan for today? I'm like, you have so much energy. I want some of that. Thank you, you know. But we have to give to something that outlives us, right? Because legacy isn't about what you keep. It's about what you give. It's about what you send ahead of you. I love the way Winston Churchill said it. He says, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. We make a life by what we give. Do you notice that your children, that maybe you could think back this too, your children never remember what you keep. They always remember what you gave. They remember the time you gave to that homeless person on the street. They remember the time that you gave at church. They remember the time you gave of your time to serve on a Sunday. They remember the times that you give more than they remember the times they got that weird toy that they played with for an hour and threw away. Come on. We got to give to something that outlives us. But it's not just about giving, the psalmist said. It's also about living. It's about living so that my life outlives me. We can't just give so my life outlives me. It's so we can live so my life outlives me. We conduct our affairs with justice, with righteousness. This is living beyond yourself. And I believe this is the answer to all your problems. You're going, whoa, Pastor Crick. I believe this is the answer to all, all your problems. I believe all the problems in your life, this will solve it. Listen to me. And you're going, whoa, 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 Pastor Chris. That, that's a heavy statement. You saying this will solve all my problems? Listen to this. The real secret to solving your problems is to have something bigger in your life than your problems. You're going, What? Because if your problems are leading and guiding your decisions of giving and living, guess what? Then your problems are your God. But if you have a God who is bigger than that financial struggle you're going through, if you have a God who's bigger than the cancer who this doctor said, well, oh, it's stage four, it's, it's gonna come back, it's gonna, uh-uh, because I'm post focusing my view on a God who is bigger than my promises, a God who can heal, who can restore, who can redeem, who can provide. I'm relying on a God who is bigger than that. So when we live in a way that outlives ourselves, then we go, man, this is so much bigger than I am. My problems become so much smaller. Let me say it this way. The goal isn't to live on earth for, forever, but to leave something that does. I think it's so funny in our culture today that we've, we've became so inclusive of everyone and everything. I mean, commercials have changed. And, and for the better, I believe, we've, we've gotten more accepting of different things. Some of them bad, some of them good. But like the one thing that we're still all, all kind of up in arms about or that, that I can't, I kind of thought my wife and I were talking about the other day was really funny, is anti-aging cream. I don't know what it is about the creams. Every commercial is about looking younger. Think about it for a moment. It's like, oh no, you can like do whatever you want, be whoever you want, do whatever you want. But if you have crow's feet, girl, come on. <laughs> right? I mean, why do we want to look younger when everyone knows you're getting older? There's something still in us that wants to live on this earth and to be okay. Like maybe I'm a Benjamin Button. Maybe I'm getting younger. <laughs> And it doesn't work that way because we have to be focused not on this earth forever, but leaving something that does live forever. Leaving something that does. So this morning, I want to help us know how to do that. I want to help us know how to not just leave a legacy, but to live a legacy life. Amen? Who's ready? Who wants to live a legacy life this morning? Great. Let me ask, let me ask you another question. How many remember in school taking those standardized testings? Come on. I mean, well, they still have them today. I, I grew up in Georgia. I took the ITBS test. I'm not even sure I still know what it stands for, but I just say ITBS testing, right? And we all, we all took those tests and the teachers made a big deal. And my mom's a teacher. She made a big deal out of it. 
And I'll never forget, in third grade, my, my teacher comes up and she's like, guys, it's test time and you spend three days. And, uh, and, and I'm there and they hand out the Scantron. Where are my Scantron people at? Come on. You remember the Scantron? You know, come on. You got the Scantron and then you got the booklet on the other side. You, you remember this, right? You, some of y'all are laughing because you remember this, right? You got the Scantron, which was high tech back in the day. And then you had the booklet next to you. And our teacher's like, hey, guys, she was trying to calm us because we had all anxiety about doing well on the test. She's like, guys, listen to me. Um, I just want you to do your best. I want you to know this, this test doesn't really matter. I want you to know that it's not about what grade you get. And that you want to know as a third grader what I heard. Wah, 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 wah. It doesn't matter. Wah, 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 wah. Oh, really? I said it. So I just began, like, I got my Scantron and my booklet, and I just kept hearing, it doesn't matter how you do. And I'm going, well, if it doesn't matter. And as I got the Scantron, my creative mind started to flow. I didn't see multiple choices, A, B, C, and D. You always pick D, all of the above. Everyone knows that, but... I didn't see multiple choices. I saw the design I had to create. <laughs> and that design wasn't just any design. It was a unique design called a Christmas tree design. <laughs> For the next three hours, I mathematically calculated how I could answer all the questions, but yet still make a Christmas tree design on my Scantron. Because it didn't matter. I did not open my testing book because it didn't matter. And I created this beautiful masterpiece at the end, second to only the Super Bowl that I won. I'm so proud of it. And I turned it in and got every answer wrong, okay? <laughs> Needless to say, I got called into the next, next day I got called into the office. I got rebuked for that, but she lied. Who lied? The teacher lied to me. It did matter. It did matter. And God bless her soul. I don't know where she is now, but I needed to be prepared for the test. And she said it didn't matter. It mattered then. And so I can sit up here and tell you that no, there's no tests in the Bible. Hey, don't worry about that. that it's my job as your pastor. One of them is to lead you at, on earth, to lead you how to live a better godly life. But it's also at the end of age. It's also to lead you and prepare you for the tests that are coming. You're going, what? There's tests in heaven? Absolutely. Now you're going, I don't know if I want to go to heaven, Pastor Chris. <laughs> how many of you are great test takers? You're going, I'm a good test taker. You're good. Shame on you. God. But we need to be prepared for the test. In the Bible, they don't call them tests. They call them judgments. And why is this important for our legacy? Because how we view the tests is going to determine how we prepare now for the test. Amen? And how we prepare now for the test is the life of legacy that we are leaving and living. So I want to help you with the test. Can I help you with the test? Because I, I, I do. I think it's really big. But first, let me tell you that there will be tests when you face it. Roman 14 says it this way. For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. You're going, oh, yep. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. Verse 12. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. And so there's two tests, two judgments, or two questions that I believe that God will answer. Now, Biblically, theologically, I don't know how God's going to do it at the end of age. I don't know if we're all going to stand in a line like at Disney World of Six Flags where, where we pull a number and we wait in line and they're like, number 87, Chris Reese. And I'm like, me, God? And I come in, give my number. But I can tell you what's on the tests. I can tell you what I think the answers might be. And I can tell you what the questions will be. Because the first question, the first judgment that we're going to have is going to be for everyone. For both non-Christians, non-believers, and Christians. Everyone's going to have to answer this question. And it's question number one. It's judgment number one. What did you do with my son, Jesus? What did you do with my son, Jesus? 
This judgment is called the great white throne judgment. It's in Revelation 20. We read about it. It says this, then I, this is John, John, I saw the great white throne and him who was seated on it. And the earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, everyone standing before the, th- the great white throne. And the books were opened, but another book was opened. This is the book we want, the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. So we're coming before God. I want you to picture yourself. We're coming before God, the great white throne. And he's asking the question, what did you do with my son, Jesus? And we're going to come up and I know what I would naturally say. I would say all the great things that I did. God, I went to OSC like at least every other Sunday, at least. And then I sang a song. I raised my hands to hear. I almost got to hear, but didn't do it. I stayed here, God. Could have gotten better. I sang a song. I read a book about you one time. It said your name in it. Uh, I prayed. I raised my hand at the end when they prayed for people to be born again. I raised my hand. Pastor Chris acknowledged me. He pointed at me. And then I prayed. I've been baptized, God. We begin making all of these. And all these things are great things. We begin making this, te- this, this list of all the great things that we have done. But they're all the wrong answer to this question. Why, Pastor Chris? Because salvation into the kingdom of heaven is never earned by what you do. It's only given and received through Jesus Christ and the price that he paid on the cross. That is it. That is it. Forgiveness of sins and salvation and entrance into heaven is only through one person because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So what's the right answer? The right answer is this. I knew him personally. What did you do with my son Jesus? I knew him personally. It's not head knowledge, it's heart knowledge. That's the Greek word. Because Jesus made it very clear that at the end of time, there will be some people that will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out? Didn't we feed the homeless? Didn't we go on a cool mission trip? Didn't we work for the church? Didn't we serve the church? Wasn't I a pastor for you? Didn't I help people? Didn't I go to serve day, go to church, give my tithe? Didn't I do all of these things? And the Bible records in Matthew chapter seven, Jesus said this, that they'll say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. This test is not about what you have done. It's about who you know. Come on. It's about who you know. And some of you, I know in your past, not now, in your past, you've gone to some clubs, you party. I get it. Some of you have done that. How many know getting into some of those things? It's all about who you know, right? My dad, my dad in New Orleans would use my name sometimes to get, get a restaurant reservation when it was packed. I am not a big deal. I am like ashamed. I'm like, oh gosh, cringing. I'm like, did the guy know me? He's like, yeah, he knew you. But my dad would just flash, oh, I'm I'm Chris Reese's son. He's like, oh, sir, it's not packed at all. Here, come right in. Because it wasn't about what he did. It was about who he knew. It was about who he knows. And it's about who we know. Listen to me. Eternity is based on relationship, not religion. It's on who you know. So if you answer that first one correctly, the gates of heaven open up and you're like, oh my gosh, it's beautiful, right? I'm imagining. This is not in the Bible, okay? It's beautiful in here. Streets of gold. You're twirling. If you want to twirl, you don't have to, but you're walking. Mama and them are there. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. But there's another test or judgment you're going to face in heaven. And you're going, what? Heaven's the worst now. There's a test in heaven. There is a test in heaven. There's a judgment in heaven. But this is just for just the believers because after you have passed that first test, next comes the next one. And this is just for the Christians. And here's what Jesus is gonna say. He's gonna ask, I believe is this. Judgment number two is this. What did you do with what I gave you? This is not a bad judgment. This is the, actually the judgment seat of Christ. It's called in scripture. This is a reward judgment. You're going, what? It's a reward judgment? Yeah. 
It's a reward judgment. This is not a judgment where you get cast down. You just might not get as much as Fred over there. You're going, why does Fred have a mansion? Well, Fred, hey, I gave him a little and he did a lot with it. What did you do with what I gave you? So there's no bad parts of heaven, right? There's no, uh, there's no bad parts of heaven, but this is when you get in. This is a reward because how many know God is a rewarder. He's a good father who wants to reward his children. It's not performance. He doesn't love you any less. He's just asking the question, what did you do to store up treasures in heaven? What did you do with what I gave you? It's called the judgment seat of Christ. Second Corinthians five says it this way. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive, if I say receive, receive what is due for him or her for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. This is the legacy test. This is why it's so important that we don't just leave a legacy, we live a legacy life. This is a celebration of those who made a difference in life. This is the presentation of the Super Bowl ring, right? This is the participation medal. My, my six-year-old keeps asking, first year in soccer, when he loses a game, Daddy, do we still get a medal? I'm like, yes, son, you still get a medal, right? This is when you walk in, it's like, what did you do with what I gave you? Not what, I, what you didn't have. Not what the person next to you gave or did. Well, I, I don't have as much as them. With what God gave you. Because each of us has something that God has given us. Each of us has a gift that God has given us to utilize for his kingdom to multiply for other people. It's the point of being a Christian. And you're going, well, Pastor Chris, how do I then, how do I do this? How do I pass this test? How do I live a life that God rewards? Here's the right answer you're going to say. If he comes and says, what did you do with what I gave you? You're going to say, here's the right answer. I gave my life away. I didn't keep it. I didn't hoard it. I didn't hold it. Watch this. Some of you, I didn't protect it. I gave my life away. That when I was driving and I saw a homeless person, I didn't roll up the window and act like I didn't see them all of a sudden. I'm like, oh, look over there. No, no, no. I drove by. I rolled down my window. I didn't just give them money. I said, let me pray for you, sir. What's your name? My kids see me do that every time I pass because I ask what their name is because I want them to know that people on the street that are falling on hard times, they still have names and God still loves them. And I will pray for them and we will love them. I will give my life away. You see, this is the legacy answer that I want to challenge you with today. This is the legacy answer Yes, you'll be in heaven. Has nothing to do with your salvation. Nothing to do with your salvation. This is where you're going to be placed in, in, in heaven. Maybe you're going to be by the river. Ooh, a little bayou front. Come on. Maybe you're going to place by the tree. That's the really good spot. Just saying. But some of y'all might just be stuck over with no, Moses over there, right? <laughs> or Thomas, doubting Thomas. Hey, he's a doubter. Put him over, right? It's about what you have and what you're doing with what you have. It's about giving your life away. Well, Pastor Chris, how do I do that? How do I live a legacy life? I'm gonna close real quick. I'm gonna close. I wanna give you three things. Look at me. I wanna help you. This whole series will help you learn how to live a legacy life and to leave a legacy. You are never too young to think about this. But look at me. Look up at me, look up at me, listen to me. How do you live a legacy life? How do you give your life away? It doesn't happen by accident. It has to be intentionally given. Intentionality is the key to giving away your life, to be able to answer that question, to be able to have future faithfulness. I wanna give you three things and we're gonna close this morning. Number one, we have to live it intentionally. We have to intentionally serve others. Intentionally serve others. 
This is what Jesus did. Though he was the greatest, he became the least, the Bible says. And he challenged the disciples who were arguing about whether they were going to sit in a throne and be a king, be a prince. They wanted to be in the royal priesthood there. And, and Jesus looked at him and said, you want to be the goat? You don't have to throw like Tom Brady. You don't have to have stats like Drew Brees. You don't have to jump like Michael Jordan. You don't have to hit a golf ball like Tiger Woods. To be the goat in heaven, you have to become a servant to all. You have to become a servant of all. You have to serve others. How do I do that? Pastor Joseph just told you, some of us just need to take our next step and go to Next Steps class. Get on the serve team. Just start serving others where you're at. You, you might open the door for people and just be the best greeter. You just, you're, you're joyful. So you just, hey, how's it going? Come on in, OSE, right? Uh, right? You might be that person. You might carry a bucket and carry a container and collecting tithe and offering, but you have something to give, serving others. Some of you leading a small group, hosting a small group, uh, going to encounter nights, praying for other people, Showing your children, listen to me, that you were planted in a local church and that we believe that if Jesus died for the church, it is our job to be the church then. And you begin serving others. You begin serving others. You begin serving others. Our kids never remember what they get. They always remember how we gave. Always. The next thing you do is not just serving others. We have to intentionally give what we have. Give what you have. Look, look at me. Not what you don't have, what you have. Not what you can't tithe, what you can tithe. Give what you have, what you have been given. Once again, all of us have something to give. All of us do. I remember one time Pastor Eugene told me, and I love Pastor Eugene. He's our, our, our lead pastor over at our Opelousas campus. And he always says, you know how, you know when I know I, can, I need to worry about you, Pastor Chris? I said, when? He said, when you don't walk into the room with energy or joy, something's wrong. And I began thinking about it. He said, and he, he called it this, your superpower, he said, is joy. And I said, it is joy. <laughs> What's your superpower? Something you just do because you are, not because you have to. Something that God has given you. For some of you, you're, you're a great encourager. You need to go encourage people. You love on people. Some of you, you're prayer warriors. You need to pray. Some of you are amazing at just loving on those that are in hospitals and praying for the sick and being pastoral in that. You need to go serve others where you are. Go give what you have. Go give what you have. Not what you don't have. What you have. You want to know why? Because how many of you live in America? How many of you live in America? Some of y'all, that just went way over your head. Way over. If you got up this morning, had a cup of coffee, had a little bite to eat, got in the car, drove over here, sitting in air conditioning, guess what? You are, you're doing better than 99.9% .9 of the world right now. I don't care what problems we have in this country. We got a lot of them. We still live in the best country in the world. We are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed. That's not denying the things that are happening in this world or in your life, but we are blessed. And it is our job to be a blessing and give what we have. Number three is finally, it's this. And here's where we close. We intentionally share Christ. Whoa, Pastor Chris, you just said share Christ. Isn't that your job? I'm reminded of what the great Francis of Assisi said this. He said, preach the gospel always and sometimes use words. All of us are sharing Christ. At some point, all of us are sharing Christ. Because reaching people and building lives is what all of us should do. Because how many of you know, Jesus is still the only one that changes lives, y'all. He 
he's still the only one that can break addictions. He's still the only one who can put the orphan and the widow and the lonely into family. He's still the only one who can do miracles. He's still the only one who gives purpose to the next generation who is purposeless. He's still the only one that can save your lost friends and loved ones. He's still the only one. He's still the only one. And we share Christ because we know he has changed our lives. So I want him to change your life and your life and your life and your life and everyone's life. Because reached people reach people. Built people build people. It's just what we do to live and to leave a legacy. So I'm excited. Why are you excited, Pastor Chris? I'm excited because we have an opportunity in two weeks. Everybody say two weeks. Two weeks. It's November 6th. It's our legacy offering. We get to partner with God to believe that in this house and in this church, amongst all five of our campus, we're going to raise a million dollars. What are you going to do with it? We're going to give it all away. What do you mean? You're going to, we're going to give it all away. Can't take it with us. We might as well send it ahead of us then. Because you have family members and loved ones that still need reaching, that still are lost. We have family members and loved ones who are still addicted. We have family members and loved ones who are still on hard times. It is our job as a church to rise up and to help, to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to plant the apple tree, to do the hard work now for future faithfulness later. What are we going to give to, Pastor Chris? I'm glad you asked. (laughs) How many of you know someone in addiction, in recovery, could be a family member, loved one, friend. Many of us do. Many of us do. We're committed to this. We're still continuing in our fight against addiction. And we're still continuing in our fight against addiction. My father was an addict for over 40 years. His father was an addict all his life. My dad, finally, when he found Jesus, it was the only thing that broke addiction in his life. And he vowed At 47 years old, when he overcame that addiction, he vowed and said, I do not want other men to go through what I went through. We're still continuing that fight. So we're gonna give a portion of it to our retreat at sunset. What's that, Pastor Chris? It's a ministry. It's a house where we take men that have come out of long-term addiction rehabilitation and we transition them into the house. And we teach them, watch this, We teach them how to become a man of God. We teach them how to have a job, how to serve the church. We teach them life skills to get them better, to become better men of God, to help them realize they are new now. They don't have to go back to the old life. And through your generosity, last year alone, Michael Hankins and Victoria Hankins, who are directors over at the retreat at Sunset, they helped, get, they helped over 200 families that were struggling with addictions are now made whole. That's because of what you have done. It's the miracle of God. It's the miracle of God. And we're continuing that fight because you have a loved one who needs help. Look at me. And because I'm tired, I'm tired of doing overdose funerals of fathers who have a four-year-old little daughter sitting in the front row wondering if her daddy's going to come home. In a three-month period last year, we did over 10 overdose funerals. I'm tired of it. And I believe Jesus is the way, the only way. And I am committed that not one more child will lose their father again or mother or anyone else. Because what you have done has been amazing. One story I want to tell you about, about a man named Jacob. He went to adult adult and teen challenge. And as he was there, the, the staff said that it was the worst addiction case they had ever seen in the history of teen challenge. 
He had the worst addiction than anyone had ever seen. And they thought that he, he might never recover. And Jacob had two boys, beautiful little boys. And those boys got put in the foster care system because he couldn't care for them. So while he was at Teen Challenge for a year, the Lord began to break things off of him in the name of Jesus. Every addiction started falling and he was healed. He began healing. But as he ended his year at Teen Challenge, he was wondering, what do I do next? In comes the retreat at sunset. Michael and Victoria Hankins invited him in. He, he began the program and in three months, he did amazing things because he had a laundry list of items he had to complete in order to get his kids back. And this father was desperate to be with his sons who spent two years in foster care, two years without their father. And so Jacob ended up grinding and grinding. He got a job where he began to tithe to the church and he served the church and give everything else to his kids. He began paying off all his court fees, his fines, his debt. He began faithfully doing what was right. He began working towards that. He got his GED, he got his driver's license, but his boys were in need because without notice, the foster care system was gonna have to move them. And he had a week, a week to get a place to live and to furnish it for two boys. Can I tell you this? Because of your generosity, he ended up finding a place to live. Because of your generosity, the boys now have a new room fully furnished. They have a backyard to play in. And watch this, a family is made whole. Why? Because of your generosity. Check out Jacob and his sons. Look at that serving faithfully at our Opelousas campus. You want to know what legacy looks like? It looks like that right there. That's not just leaving a legacy. That is a living legacy for his boys. A father reunited with his boys. Michael was telling us that the move-in day was so emotional, so emotional, because they were overwhelmed that the sons were back with the father and these two little boys, show the next picture. These two little boys who had been in foster care system for two years now see their dad healthy and whole. You wanna know what I'm committed to? I'm committed to redemption and restoration of people. Why? Because Jesus is. And the retreat at sunset, a portion of what, what, what comes in, we're gonna give to that because we believe we believe in what God is doing there, that he's breaking hurts, habits, and hangups. But we're not just giving to the retreat at sunset. The next project we're giving to is a foster care system. You're going, what? The governor's wife called one of our church family, one of our pastors, and said, we need help. In Louisiana, we, are, we have nothing. There's so many kids that need homes foster homes. We can't place them anywhere and they're desperate and she's calling the church. Do you know this? That if every church in Louisiana fostered one child, there'd be no need for a foster care system. Because my God says that he, he says care for the orphans and the widows. And listen, we all cheered and rejoiced when Roe versus Wade was overturned and we believe that more babies will be born this year than ever before that would have been aborted. And listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play something heavy on you. It is a sin if we rejoice in that, but we deny them the life that God wants them to live. So we're gonna give to foster care initiatives in some way, shape, form, or fashion. We're gonna, we're gonna find the best ones out and we're gonna begin giving. We're gonna be committed some of you foster children, thank you for your sacrifice. It's not easy to take in a child, almost love them like your own and then give them away sometimes. Thank you. But we're committed to helping, not just from the womb, but all the way to the tomb, life and life abundantly. The next thing that we're, we're gonna give to you, and I'm so excited about this, it's all about our next generation. We're gonna be starting Our Savior's College in January where Dr. Scott Adams, who has two doctorates, 
I don't know who needs two doctorates, but he does. I don't know. But he's going to be leading that college and opening that college because I'm tired of our young people having a call to ministry and we have to send them somewhere else. I want to keep them in the house. I want to keep them growing. I want to keep giving them a place to go to. I want to, get, I want to raise up pastors and worship leaders. Why? Because we still need to reach more people and build more lives. And that leads to our final project. Our final project, Pastor Jacob, two weeks from now, will announce that we'll be launching a new campus in 2023. Now, listen, you might be going, Pastor, are you asking me for money? Look at me. No. No. Then what are you asking me to do? I'm asking you to ask God what he wants you to do. Every single year for the past eight years, when October, November, December rolls around, there's legacy. My wife and I have prayed and prayed and prayed. God, what do you want us to do? It's not what Pastor Jacob wants us to do. It's not what Pastor Joseph or any of our past team. It's what, God, what do you want me to do? So right in front of your seat back pocket, I want you to pick up one of these cards. It's a legacy card. Right in front of your seat back pocket. Every one of them, one per family. That's fine. Pick it up. Pass it down. I just want you to pick it up and hold it. You don't have to do anything with it right now. Just hold it. Because I want you to do three things. Number one, I want you to pray. And I say pray. I want you to pray. You and your wife, go home and pray. God, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to do? What do you want us to give? Because on November 6th, in two weeks, you're going to have an opportunity to come back and to give your greatest gift to say, God, this is our offering. This is how we live and leave a life of legacy. And you're going to give. And when you come back, here's what we want you to do. I want you to pray. But number two, I want you to attach your greatest need with your greatest gift. So on here, you have the opportunity to write your greatest need. Some of you, it could be a lost child. You're going, I just want them to come to know Jesus. I want my husband to come to church with me. God, we need a house. We need a home. Whatever it is, we need a job of finances. What's your greatest need? Many times, Michelle and I, it's our kids. One year we prayed for our son. He had chronic asthma. We prayed that God would heal him. And we brought our greatest need with our greatest gift. Can I tell you? He's completely healed now. He has zero asthma. Well, Pastor Chris, is it because you gave? How much did you give? It's probably because you gave. No, no, no. You're not buying anything from God. God gave his best in Jesus Christ. It's our turn to give our best and say, God, we know you can meet it. And even if you have nothing to give, I still want you to write down your greatest need because we want to pray for it. And we want to stand and believe with you. And then number three, I want you to bring your card back. Bring your card back and your gift on November 6th to Legacy Sunday. So I just want you to pray. God, what do you want us to do? What's our greatest need? But Lord, what's our greatest gift? And in that, here's what's so cool. I I see family members walk up on Legacy Sunday and we're gonna have baskets up front. You know what's cool? I I see family members walking up with their little kids. Remember, your kids will remember what you give away, not what you give to them. And I see family members walking up weeping. They both, they all have their hand on the card and they place it in the basket with their greatest gift and their greatest need. God, it's all yours. And it's so emotional. It's so freeing. It's so life-giving as a church family to come together like that. And we're believing that God is going to leave a legacy that is beyond anything we could ask or imagine. So Father, today we thank you. We thank you that you've chosen us to be ambassadors for you. That you're making your appeal through us, God. So I pray for each and every single person in here as they go home and pray, would you put that gift on their heart? Put that need on their heart, God. Let them write it down and share it with their church family, Lord. Let us shoulder that burden with them together as we pray over their greatest need. Maybe it's a a loved one that needs healing from cancer, God. 
but we're gonna pray over that greatest need on November 6th. And we're gonna bring our greatest gift to you because you gave us your greatest gift in, in your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that you love us that much. And with all heads bowed and all eyes closed this morning for the next two minutes, I wanna go back to that first test and make sure that everyone gets to pass that first test. What did you do with my son, Jesus? My prayer is that you know him personally. And if you don't, I wanna give you an opportunity this morning. How do I do that, Pastor Chris? It's as simple as A, B, C. A, we just admit we're sinners in need of a savior. B, believe that what Jesus did on the cross was enough to cover our past, present, and future sins. And C, we confess him as savior. He saves us, and now he is Lord over our lives. It's not about what church you've gone to, how long you've been in church, how many times you've been in church. It's about giving your life to Jesus and knowing him personally and committing your life to walk in a direction with him. Not in perfection, but in direction. It's called being born again. It's like your physical birthday where you're only born once and your spiritual birthday, you're only born one time. And today can be your spiritual birthday. I'm gonna pray a prayer. And on the count of three, if that's you, you say, Pastor Chris, include me in that born again prayer. I want today to be my spiritual birthday. Today, I want to commit my life to Jesus, to know him personally, to walk with him. On the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass you. I'm just, just going to be me looking, and we're all going to pray a prayer together. But if that's you on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, God is calling you here. Two, he brought you here in this moment, at this time, for this reason. Three, raise your hand and wave it at me high. Wave, wave it at me high. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Awesome. 18, 19, I see you. Wonderful. You can put your hands down. The last 10 seconds, if you raise your hand once, you don't ever have to raise it again. But if you guys should have raised my hand, Pastor Chris, this is for you. I want you to raise it now. Wave it at me right now. Anyone else? Awesome. Awesome. I see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, church. With all those hands that were raised this morning, we're all gonna say this prayer together. Repeat after me, dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, my guilt, and you died for it. I believe you faced hell for me so I would not have to go and rose on the third day to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn away from my sin to be born again. Say this with me. God is my father. Jesus is my savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is now my home. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give it up for all those who prayed that prayer this morning. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning? I want to bless you and dismiss you. At the end, when I say amen, our prayer partners are going to be up here. If you need some personal prayer, I know they would love to pray with you and for you. Don't forget Wednesday, Encounter Night, 630. Women, last Bible study this Thursday, 6.30, and then Harvest Fest this Saturday. Bow your heads, let me bless you and dismiss you. Father, we thank you for this time. God, thank you for your word that doesn't condemn, it convicts. It challenges us, God. So I pray, pray this week we are challenged by the power of your Holy Spirit to pray, to seek you, to seek what a legacy is. How do we live a legacy life, God? And let us be intentional about everything that we do to serve others, to glorify your name, to share Christ with those who don't know you, God. We thank you that you're with us and you're for us. Would you go before us, guard us, guide us, and keep us? I bless you now as your pastor, in the name of the Father, his son Jesus, and the all-abiding Holy Spirit. And everybody said amen. Amen. We love you guys. God bless you. You're dismissed.